Uh, today I have, um, go ahead and introduce yourself, guys. My name is Alex Gunnarsson. I'm the director of esports for Randolph Macon College. Oh, and I'm Josh Buchanan. Uh, I just moved to Alvernia University after spending three years as the head coach at Ashland University. So today we're going to go through a variety of topics pertaining to uh, esports coaching. So the first topic for today's conversation is, so guys, how would you go about finding and vetting a good collegiate coach? Yeah, so I might be a weird circumstance. So I played collegiately in college, and a lot of the coaches here at Randolph Macon are actually like some of my former like teammates and players uh, that attended with me. So it's a lot. Of, a lot of it comes down to network. I think um, that's why I really like the NACE uh, Discord as well. Like has a good network where you can like meet other people and talk to other people. And I think vetting is kind of difficult for sure because not all directors are top players. Um, but I would again probably rely on my network, is getting recommendations, talking to other people. And really emphasizing like an understanding of the game rather than just a knowledge. Like a lot of people can like memorize certain things, but having someone that can like discuss like the, the decision making process, I think is really important for coaches. Yeah, yeah, I, I completely agree. Um, you know, it's there's that old saying, what is it like teach a man, bring a man a fish, he eats for a day, teach a man to fish, he eats for a lifetime. And I think that's definitely true is that esports is changing so quickly that having a coach that can think critically and have these discussions with their team is going to be much more valuable than a coach who just became the master of one meta or has a lot of just knowledge in general. Um, as far as how to find a coach, um, definitely using uh, schools near you is a great way to get advice from them, right? Kind of talk to them about uh, one, what should you be looking for as you make a job posting? Kind of what are reasonable expectations? Um, of course, anyone at the NACE national office or anyone um you could reach out to who are other members of NACE, any other directors you can find. Uh, the NACE Discord is great. There's tons of people who would be willing to help you. Um, and then you got to get it posted in the right place, of course. Um, hit marker jobs, I think, is kind of the go-to. Um, you can also post on the NACE website. Um, there's a few different discords that are really good that will get you a lot of traction and a lot of interest in your position. Um, it's so many people's dreams to work full-time in esports. And I think if you can create the right job posting with the right expectations, and then get that posted in the right places like a kit marker, you'll get a lot of interest. So as far as finding the coach, I think that's step one. And then vetting, I would say, I think a great way to do it is just to recognize that you you may or you may not have all the information. If you do, and you, you already like know how to vet a coach well, then I think that's great. Getting a second opinion can't hurt. But again, look for a lot of the stuff Alex said. But if you're not sure, just consult somebody else. Um, if I was hiring a baseball coach, I would have no idea. And I would go ask other baseball coaches what they would look for. And I think you'll get a lot of genuine responses from the esports community because we all want to have really cool colleagues that we can learn from and grow with as well. So I think definitely hop in the NACE Discord and ask the other directors, other coaches, uh, what they would be looking for if they were hiring. Yeah, a, a big emphasis I'd like to make as well is it's nice to have a high ranked player as your coach, like they know the game really well, but it does definitely does not guarantee that they're a good coach just because they're good at the game for sure. Yeah, totally. And uh, again, it, it, it's, it's, it's a mixed bag there, right? Like um, you might have a high level player who's a great coach. You might have one that isn't at all. And it, it just depends, right? Uh, and that's something that I think hopefully you as a, either an athletic director or an esports director, um, can kind of get a feel for, are they thinking critically? Are they able to communicate with others? Are they able to build a consensus with their team? Um, are they able to lead? Um, and I think those are things that you can kind of pick up even if you aren't totally in tune with the game. Um, and of course, letters of reference, super good, just like any other job, right? Or maybe not letters, but rather just calls, right? Find talking to people they've worked with in the past, um, getting a second opinion definitely does not hurt at all. Um, and of course, just, uh, and this will be a common thread. I'm sure I'm going to say this 10 times today, but um, find what fits your institution, right? What are your institution's goals? What are you expecting from your coach? And make sure that that coach wants to meet those goals, will enjoy themselves meeting those goals and can do it, can do the job. Um, Cause every school is going to be looking for something a little bit different from their coach. So in the, in the world of coaching, right? Where do things like gamer sensei and aim trainer kind of fit into that, that kind of puzzle? It's definitely a start. It's a good way to meet a lot of people. I think at the end of the day, if you can interview more people than not, it definitely helps. Um, so I think that's a great start. And then using that network to really like narrow down that search and like find the person best for you, I think is a good start. Yeah. Yeah. Um, I know, uh, I believe Boise State has used 
um, Gamer Sensei in the past to hire some coaches. And I think it's a great way, especially if they can be remote. Um, if they're maybe a game specific coach, that could be a great way to go. Um, I know uh, I think Gamer Sensei actually started back when I was playing StarCraft like eight, nine years ago. And I had a lot of friends who actually kind of got their start in coaching on Gamer Sensei. Um, so I definitely think there is some potential there. Um, as far as aim trainer, I, I'm, I'm not sure if that'll help you find a coach, but I definitely think it's good to train your aim. Uh, they have a lot of customization for um, they have a lot of customization for each game. So like if you're an Overwatch player, you can have it mimic exactly the character that you're training for in Overwatch, things like that. So uh, definitely worthwhile, I think. If you play FPS, maybe not for your Hearthstone players, but yeah. So after discussing like sort of finding and vetting a coach, let's get into like the actual coaching. So so what should a daily practice look like in, in the world of collegiate esports? And Josh, you want to answer that first? Yeah, yeah, sure. Um, that is a loaded question in that I think it changes so much based on your team, based on your expectations for your team, your expectations for your program time of the season um but i think in general i think for most teams practicing three days a week at least makes a ton of sense um i know some teams practice as much as like five or six um i'd imagine most people listening are are thinking of collegiate esports coaching in which case i think having them practice like it's their full-time job probably not the play um especially considering for esports for most of us we're playing year-round and we're coaching year-round and i think that while maybe a baseball team in season might practice five or six days a week, they're only in season for three or four months. And then maybe they go into uh, like where they're just lifting twice a week. So for us, I think it's really important to have a practice schedule that meets the time expectations and also like the burnout rate of your students so that they are staying fresh. They're still interested. They're able to balance their schoolwork. So I'd say that's number one um, is kind of setting the schedule and then Number two for me would be varies a ton based on the game and a ton based on what your team needs. Like, uh, like uh, w- when we started at Ashland, our Overwatch team was all gold and platinum. And to be honest, with a team that's mostly gold and platinum, like you can work on teamwork all you want and it's still going to help, but not nearly as much as helping them improve individually. So we spent a lot of our practices doing what I call like either what I call pure coaching where one player would sit behind the other player as they're laddering. And then they would kind of talk through the game together. And then they would also, after the game kind of pick on a cup, pick up on a couple of things and occasionally go through the VOD. Um, I think things like that, things like VOD review that focus more on the individual are really good when your team is a lower level, but as your team improves, maybe focusing on teamwork, doing more VOD review or just getting tons of scrimmages in is going to be the play. So speaking from my own coaching experience, I've had teams and it seems like all they want to do is scrim, 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 scrim. What kind of value do you place on scrimming? And then what other recommendations do you have? Because as you've stated, teams of varying skill levels require various remedies. They require different sort of practices. So so what kind of value do you put on scrims and what kind of value do you put on other things such as VOD review or your peer coaching? Uh, I don't know if you want to take that, Alex, or if you, yeah, if you want to. Yeah, I take can. It. Oh, I'm really glad I let you go first, Josh, because I was going to give them like a default practice. So, but yeah, you're absolutely right. Like it does vary a lot based on the game and stuff. As far as scrims goes, like uh, at least for a rule of thumb that I like to use, and this is maybe like uh, controversial, but I really think that scrimming down is really useful. A lot of people are always looking for teams better than themselves and like learning from their mistakes and stuff. But I think there's a lot of value in scrimming teams worse than you as well, uh, because you can like limit test more, you can like build your confidence. Like there's definitely value in that as well, um, depending on your team. Other things I would add in with practice would be a lot of the boring stuff, like uh, just aim training, uh, team discussions, theory crafting, there's a lot that goes into practice. And something I really emphasize is you got to be practicing something. If you don't have like a theme in mind when you're going into practice, like you like to do a huddle to start all of our practices. And it, you kind of like talk about what you're going to work on that day. Because if you don't have a theme, if you don't have something you're working on, then you're just playing the game for two hours. Um, so really focus on those things and throwing in some of that boring stuff that people don't always do at home. Like it really makes a huge difference. Yeah. Yeah. I, I totally agree. I think intentionality in your coaching is, and in your practices is very, very important. Um, I think that honestly, that's probably one of, I'd say the two biggest difference makers between someone trying to improve on their own and someone trying to improve inside of a a team environment 
is that uh, the first one is that intentionality and the second is the motivation. And I think um, if you can find a way to, in your practices, to keep your students motivated by doing things they think are fun, um, letting them see that improvement, um, and then be very intentional with what you're working on, that can be big. Um, another thing I'd emphasize is that if you're picking a theme for the week or a theme for the two weeks at period, or even just a theme for this practice, if it's a small concept, um, may, pick, pick one thing, maybe two, at the most, maybe three things to work on at a time. If um, this was a mistake I made, um, when we first started doing VOD review with our Overwatch team, because I initially three years ago did not know much about Overwatch. I was kind of thrown into it, had to figure it out um, and kind of make it work. And we would go into VOD review and we would pick out like eight different things that we thought we could do better. Or we thought we were doing wrong. And then we would go into scrims and everyone would be focused on something different. Um, and I don't know if you ever tried to improve at eight things at the same time. It's not easy, you know? Um, <laughs> it's kind of like, uh, like I imagine like people when they like try to like in new year's comes around, they try to get healthier. They try to like lift and they're like, I'm going to change my whole lifestyle all at the same time. I'm going to start sleeping better, eating better, getting exercise. And almost always they end up failing because it's hard to balance all of those things. So I think identifying either through VOD review or through your observation of the team with your coaches, your analysts, yourself, your students, I think picking one or two things and running with it can be big. And uh, we'll definitely, you'll see much more improvement that way than trying to focus on a lot of concepts at the same time. We had a big projector in front of all the, the arena, in front of all the PCs that we would use for VOD review. But like when games started or when we were like either solo queuing or scrimming, whatever we were doing, I'd take like two bullet points and just slam them on the board and be like, this is what we're working on today. Whether it's staying grouped or in League of Legends, like warding better, whatever it was, we had one or two concepts and that was it. And we we're like, this is what we're focusing on today. Yeah. And I really like Josh's point about like motivation and like burnout. Uh, like that's definitely a big thing in esports. It's very difficult. It's such a mental game. Um, and when you have themes working on it, uh, it's more than just winning the game. Like you can lose that scrim and still like it's a win because you like got better at whatever theme you were working on, like whether it be communication or aim or whatever. Um, so that's a huge thing. And also like with the burnout aspect, uh, just talking about the game. I think that's like my big takeaway that I'm going to say over and over again today is talking about the game is a great thing because nothing gets me and a lot of people more excited to play the game than talking about it. Like grinding the game for eight straight hours of solo queue, that's what's going to burn you out. That's miserable. But like talking about the game, theory crafting, that's like the exciting stuff that's going to keep you going and keep you motivated. Yeah. Yeah. I think it's really, really good um, for me, especially like when you can keep, basically when you can make the things the team's idea, you know, like I found that things that I tell my team are important. Sometimes they believe me, you know, I think they respect my, my game knowledge in some games to some extent, but when it was their idea and when we can get the team all on the same page, that this is what we need to be working on. And this is what we need to understand. Um, it goes a long way. And I think you'll find, especially on something like an Overwatch team or a League of Legends team, you're going to have some people with that is their jam. They are going to love to talk about the game theory craft. And you're going to have some people that do not want to think about it at all. And I think that's okay. Um, I don't think you need to force those people to become like, you know, <laughs> big students of the game, but I do think you need to make sure that they're on the same page as their teammates, you know, and that the, the teammates let them do their thing, you know, cause some people, they overthink, like they get out of a VOD review session and they overthink everything they just thought about or just learned. And then it gets in their head and they aren't able to play their game in scrims. So again, um, I, I, I wish I had time to say, talk about how you can cater to every single student's needs, but it doesn't work that way, right? Like it's something you kind of have to learn. Um, but every student's going to want something different. And I think for me, um, this is just my opinion, of course, that it's VOD review and being engaged with, with VOD review, while it is critical and important, I don't think it's something that you can expect everyone to be invested in equally. And it shouldn't be something like, I don't know, like a baseball team running drills or you know, running laps where it's like, well, you're not interested in VOD review. Like, I don't want to work with you. Because some people, they just aren't those kinds of players, right? They're more intuitive. And I think if you can get them engaged and have them participate, but not, they don't have to be the most enthusiastic person about it all the time to be a meaningful contributor to your team, especially if they contribute in other positive ways to the team environment. So we've, we've talked about VOD review a lot. But we've like kind of like handed around it, but, but explain it. What is that? What is that process? What are you looking huh. for when you're doing that? 
Um, so a big thing, and it's kind of like going on what we talked about before with like keeping themes. I think most of the conversation for a VOD review should be at the beginning. Like before you even start, like you don't just like go and buy and like turn on like, all right, let's see what we got today. Um, like know what you're looking for before you go into game. And I think it makes it that much easier to like recognize mistakes and keeping it to like one or two themes. Uh, you definitely don't want to like nitpick every single mistake. Like maybe if it was like a one-on-one -on -one kind of VOD review, uh, but I feel like that's almost like a waste of time for a team atmosphere. I also really like to focus on like the positives, like really like shout people out when they make a good play like really make them feel good because like that positivity is really motivating for a lot of people like not all students take feedback the same way um some are a little bit more sensitive than others so if you focus on a little bit more positivity with certain students especially the lower level players i think it'll really like motivate them and they'll see their improvement yeah yeah i i totally agree that i think like uh it's good to create a very open culture on your team where you actively point out positives and negatives. And I think obviously people naturally want to focus on the negatives sometimes, but I think making sure that you're identifying good plays and good positioning um, is really important because some players especially don't notice those things, you know, um, you know, they might get, uh, you know, a, a triple kill in league and be like, wow, I did really good. And they notice that, but they don't notice, wow, I played a really consistent, you know, bot lane, nothing really happened, but, I played super consistent last hit. Well, yeah. Yep. <laughs> like, like was very aware of what was happening on the map. Like things like that go a long way. Um, I also think that um, there's lots of things that you can do in VOD review. Like I think, hmm, how do I want to phrase this? So I think there's concepts that you can work on and then they'll be demonstrated or not demonstrated in VOD review. Like I think comparative VOD review is really big. Um, I remember for our Overwatch team, um, we were like just starting out and we were trying to understand space and how do you take space? Why is it useful? How do we do that? And we, what we did is we did a VOD review of our VOD before that. Then we talked about space. Then a week later, we did another VOD review and the difference it made was incredibly motivating for our team because we focused on one concept. We made sure we discussed it. We understood it. We watched examples of professional teams and doing that sort of thing that we identified that we didn't understand. Um, and then the difference was so, so motivating when you see your, when your team sees the value in VOD review, that's when they're going to want to do it. That's when they're going to want to talk about it because they they'll, they'll see that difference. And I think that, again, we've said this probably like three times already, but when you focus on just one or two things, I think that is the best way to do it. And also you don't have to watch the whole game or everything, you know, I think as you develop as a coach, you're going to be able to identify things that you think are important or a student will bring this to you like, Oh, this is a game that I think we should watch. Or I think we should break down this fight, but trying to watch a full best of three in league of legends is probably going to be really boring and not that impactful. So I'd say fodder review, keep it relatively short in most cases, like 30 minutes to an hour at the most, maybe even less. Um, and I think you'll get really good rewards for your time investment. I, I I've, I found something with some of the students that I've coached in the past where I'll be like, you need to do this specific principle. And they'll be like, I'm doing it, I'm doing it, I'm doing it. And they don't realize that they're not. And when you finally do pull up the VOD of the game and they're like, I'm actually not doing what I'm supposed to be doing. Have you guys have you guys experienced that issue where VOD reviews really cleared up some areas where they thought they were already doing it at a high level, but maybe they weren't? Yeah, absolutely. It's definitely a very vulnerable thing to like watch your own gameplay, especially like in front of your whole team and friends, uh, seeing all those mistakes. I really try to like emphasize, like, I appreciate you guys like being vulnerable and like, this is what's going to get us better for sure. And like what Josh is talking about is like, everyone's so different that it's so good to get people on the same page. Um, and like, I think that will really help everyone sees the game differently. Um, and if you just like look at it and negotiate, especially with some of your like closed minded, like big ego people that are sometimes hard to change their mentality on it sometimes come down to it comes down to a negotiation in that team meeting. Yeah. One thing that I've said to a couple of players, and uh, I don't know if it's really that inspirational, but it's, it's broken through to a lot of people. It's like, you're already as good as you are right now. So like when you identify mistakes, those are opportunities for you to improve. So like your mistakes, noticing your mistakes doesn't make you worse or make like, like hopefully it doesn't make you feel bad. Hopefully you're like, well, I'm already a platinum diamond league, masters league, league of legends player. And I'm still making these five, six, seven mistakes. If I can remedy these over time, then I'm just, I'm only going to get better, right? Like you're, you're not going to get worse by identifying your mistakes and doing it. So I think if you can kind of, get your team to believe and understand that 
identifying mistakes or just opportunities for improvement and that that's a good thing, that that's great. Because nothing's worse than in life in general, than knowing something isn't going how you want it to, and then not knowing what to do or have a solution to fix it. So I think that at least for me, that's kind of how I try to frame it. And I feel like it's benefited my players. Uh, switching gears a little bit. So it seems it seems fairly easy to keep kind of your starters engaged, but how do you go about keeping your subs engaged? How do you how do you keep them interested in the program? How do you retain them? How do you keep them learning? What is what is your philosophy when it comes to your, your subs? Uh, yeah, that's difficult. Yeah, that's definitely probably my biggest barrier with esports right now because it's not like traditional sports, so you can't really like get subs in there. Uh, there's usually a lot of like skill gaps and stuff. Like to add on like what Josh was saying with um everyone's like different is like, I actually arguably look at more like motivation gaps rather than skill gaps. And I get people on the same team that have that same motivation, same mentality. Um, and like the subs might like not care about the game as much. They may not want to put in as much work as some of the starters, even though they are like top level players. I want to keep that culture like on the starting lineup. Uh, but with subs, uh, what my strategy is, and of course, like I've tried a bunch of different things uh, currently is almost creating like a second team where you take your subs and you take a couple starters and you make a second team uh, competes in like a second league. And that still gives them that opportunity to compete, engage. And I think that's like the most fun part. I think subbing them in, we've had some difficulties. Like there are ways to do it, but I think like giving them the opportunity to compete despite being a sub is like probably the most positive uh, thing. Yeah. Yeah. I think I've tried a lot of different things and there, there are some approaches you can take. Um, like if you have the, the right fit, like we had a guy who was starting for us in Overwatch our first year, but then, you know, we recruited more and this guy, you know, individual skill wise was maybe wasn't quite there. Time commitment wise, couldn't commit the time to really grow at the same rate as everybody else. But he was very analytical and loved VOD review. And we're like, well, if you're interested, you can be an analyst for us. Right. So I think identifying opportunities like that or someone who can make a really good manager who loves the organizational stuff. Those are like the, uh, what I'll call the kind of the easy, the easy outs, if that makes sense. And that it, it gives them an opportunity to be engaged. You appreciate it. Cause I mean, we we all take all the help we can get. Like that is great. If someone wants to help our team be organized, that's awesome. Uh, but not everyone will be the right fit for that. Um, so I think what Alex said is just keep them competing. I think that that is big. If that means that you have a second team, um, even if it's not that you're, you have your more serious league, like, you know, maybe your, your, your Tespa, your NACE, your whatever, your, your CLOL, right. And then maybe you have a, a secondary league. That's a great way to get them involved. Cause uh, if they're just sitting there at practice and they just have to watch the team play or they just have to solo queue or whatever they have to do, like there are going to be times that that happens that you can't really help too much, but it's, they're going to lose motivation quickly. And I think um, definitely find a way to get them competing. Um, obviously an ideal way to do that is, to have enough for a full varsity and academy team slash JV team that goes a long way, but you're not always going to be in that boat. So I think what Alex said is like, you know, if you have eight league of legends players, you know, maybe you have like your, your, your quote starting five start in one league. And then you have like your, your most motivated five or the subs plus two people who really just want to keep competing, play in another league. But I think keeping them competing and making sure you, they know, that you care about what they're competing in and that you care about their progress. It goes a long way, but it's yeah, JJ. That's a tough one, man. <laughs> that's a, that's a tough one. I struggle with that big time. So on, on, on another end of the same topic, how, how do you approach a player who is maybe say challenger on a team full of plats and golds? How do you keep that student engaged? You want to start, Josh? <laughs> yeah. Oh, man. I got another really tough question. I'm glad you're asking that because these are tough. And uh, I think it's, if anything, it's good for the other coaches to know that we struggle with this thing too. Um, and I think, to be honest, I think one thing that you might want to talk to that player about is that kind of what their expectations are, right? Like hopefully heading into the program, they kind of were aware that that's what they were, were jumping into, right? Um, and that you have expectations about kind of Basically, I think it's important that you're showing that player that you're invested in them in their career or in what they want. There might be a challenger player who is just super chill, just wants to have a good time with their friends and see their teammates improve, in which case it's not that difficult to get them involved, keep them invested. Um, but if you have a challenger player that wants to be professional and their whole the rest of their team is gold and or wants to make CLL finals and the rest of their team is gold, like it's tough, right? And I think at that point, 
you need to work with them uh, and, and just be honest and upfront. Be like, we're not going to make the SeaWorld Grand Finals this year with our team that is, I guess, maybe plat average because you're challenger and the rest of the team's gold, right? Um, or, or diamond average or something. Um, and try to figure out what are they looking for? Um, how can we best accommodate that? How can we support you and your individual goals, right? Um, like, I know we were in a similar spot where we had a player who was playing in, in a ESCA advanced uh, for CSGO and the rest of our team had never played in anything higher than, than Open or IM. And what we did is we talked to the team and we kind of had almost an open discussion where it was like, like, Hey, Hunter really wants to keep going in this league. And he wants to be able to reach his goals individually while at the same time, helping us grow as a team. Are you guys okay with kind of accommodating our practice schedule so he can do both. Right. And I think giving them that individual thing that they're working on and helps keep them motivated lets them know that you're invested in them that the program is willing to accommodate and is invested in them while showing the team that this is something that your player cares about still cares about their team and wants to move forward so again everyone's going to be different and i think unfortunately there's there's a chance that that challenger player just might not be right for your program i hope it is i hope they are right and that they're a great person but there's Sometimes I, I think sometimes there's there's nothing you can do in those situations, especially if in some ways expectations were different. different. Are there other ways you can go about helping them as, as players? Um, maybe, maybe, I mean, obviously you incorporate them in team practice, but maybe going out and getting them like professional coaching on the side if they're already a, a challenger in League of Legends is top 300 in North America. Is there other things you can do to go about helping them meet their goals while still helping with team goals? Absolutely. Yeah. Like there's a lot you can do for these players. Like there are a lot of like amateur teams that are like heavily recruiting right now as like esports continues to grow. And that's like a way for them to like make more scholarship money and like keep them happy for sure. Um, like I, we've definitely had this experience a couple of times. I'll say that um, I really try to transition them into like more of a leadership role, like being a role model. Like a lot of times you'll hear the complaints, just like, Oh, I can't carry this team. Like, Oh, they're just like not good enough and stuff. So you could, you could, you have a couple options. Like you could definitely like work to enable them. A lot of our games uh, do have kind of like, utility roles and carry roles. So you can put them on a carry role and you can help enable them by putting their supporting cast on some of these utility roles to help support them and enable them to solo carry some of these matches. But otherwise, if they feel like that's a lot of pressure to put on them, then encourage them to, take the weight off their shoulders, develop their teammates, work with them, coach them and be that role model, like with student leader, like within your program to really take the team to the next level. Yeah, I think, and I, and I think that's definitely the key is like getting them involved in, in other teams as well. Um, that's big for us. Like I know for our Overwatch team, um, our first year we had, we had two guys on the team who um, basically very quickly rose from like plat level to GM very, very quickly. Um, a lot because they were really close friends and they motivated each other. Um, and at that point, like they needed something to kind of let them continue to grow. And I, I highly encourage them, especially over the summer to compete in amateur leagues, especially if they aren't someone who is burnt out from the season. Right. Um, that goes a long way. Find a team, their level that they can grow with. And that has the hidden benefit too, of that. Maybe they learn things from that team that you can bring to your team in your team environment. Um, uh, and, uh, I guess this is slightly changing topics, but, um, like, like I said, when I started in overwatch, I didn't know how to coach overwatch really at all. Like I had played in beta and I had been a, a good Starcraft player, but that's not a team game. That's not overwatch. Right. Um, and for me, I found that having my students, um, like work to figure out what the team needs to do better and network to figure out what methods we could use was big for our team because I wasn't going to come up with that stuff on my own, right? And I could look and I could search. But if you have students that are already in the scene, making friends in the scene, invested, they're going to learn the tricks of the trade faster than you will. And if you're willing to work with them and kind of parse out what's useful, what's not useful, that can go a long way. I think that's uh, Alex... actually a really important thing to talk about for a second, right? So what happens when you're a coach who is now – put in charge of a team that maybe you're not necessarily ready to coach. How do you go about getting yourself in a position to help lead this team? 
Yeah, it's definitely a lot about like the macro, I think, with your coaching staff is like that understanding. And like, it's pretty cool how like a lot of games are very similar to top level. Like if you can like learn how to be a top player at one game, it has a lot of like similar qualities. Like I know a lot of top players that are able to easily become top players in other games as well. Um, I would say that with the micro and some of the smaller like aspects of the game, there's a million hours of VODs and games, guides, everything on YouTube. Like you can like really learn a lot about the game on YouTube. And I would encourage my students to use the YouTube, like watch these guides, learn some of the like more minor stuff about the game. And then with the coach, we have some of those like team meetings, discussions, uh, talking about like high, some of the high level stuff. Cause some of these like uh, qualities I learned in like top level League of Legends, I can apply to like Overwatch, like team fighting and like decision making, like deck building with like Hearthstones, like team constantly. I can go on and on, but like the games are a lot more similar to top level than you think. Yeah. Um, I was uh, one of the players on my team was was a very very high ranking one trick Zed, and the way I approached him in practice was I kind of went to him and I was like showing him what he could do for the team because as as someone who has three million mastery points on Zed, I'm never gonna be able to teach him about inherent lane matchups like he knows all those, so it's really finding a way to incorporate like kind of how he played with the rest of the team. Yeah, yeah, I think. Again, a personalized approach, I think, is, is key. Um, getting to know your players. And obviously, if you're in your first or maybe your first year, your your second year, maybe, you might not know them that well yet. But over time, you, you will. Um, um, like, I don't think someone should go into their first week and try to learn everything about their player styles, right? That comes naturally over time through sitting with them in practice. But um, I think different things will resonate with different players and can let them learn without you having to have all that direct knowledge, right? Like there might be a player that loves to learn from guides, learns from YouTube videos. They can kind of dig into the, the body of knowledge that's out there and pick it up really quick. There's going to be some people that cannot be bothered to watch a video, right? Or maybe they can bother to watch one video, but they're not going to sit there and watch a ton, right? And I think for those players, you got to figure out what works for them. Is it a team-based discussion where as a team, you figure out what's important? Um, is it... It, do they have one mentor, one friend that they play with who they respect a ton and they'll listen and they will, you know, engage in discussion with them and figure it out. Um, are they someone who just grinds out games and that works for them? Some people that works for, I think most people they're, 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 they're a rare breed. I don't think that happens very often, but some people that works for it. So I think taking a very personalized approach is good. And if I just had to give like a one kind of catch all tip that has worked for me is that if I don't know, the specifics of a game. I, I do my best to understand the, the broad concepts um, and try to, and then I try to get my team talking. Like I learn just enough to get my team talking. And once the team gets talking, then it's important that you identify where the conversation's going and develop consensus. Consensus, I think, is it goes a long, long, long way. You can get your team playing in the same, from the same point of view, kind of the same paradigm, or at least understanding that they want to focus on the same thing because they've mutually identify that this is something that's important. I think that goes a long way. And I think that's something just to be, just to be clear, I think that's something that should not be done sitting at your computer playing the game <laughs> while that's happening. I think obviously like spur of the moment in game, you might need to make some adjustments. Those are, that's a different thing, but I think it's very important to have some time where your team just sits huddled up, sits on the couches and chairs, whatever outside of the computer area and talks and discusses like, what are we going to do? What, do we think needs to happen for us to change or what do we need to do to take it to the next level? And if the team's on the same page, that goes so, so, so far. Absolutely. Yeah. I think this might sound kind of cheesy, but a good coach might not have all the answers, but a good coach definitely knows the right questions to ask. So, so to switch gears a little bit to make sure we keep uh, everything moving. Is, do you guys have a physical aspect to your practices? Do you guys do workouts? Do you guys do stretches? What does that look like for your individual programs? Yes, uh, in our huddles uh, before and after practice where we like talk about what we're going to practice today and like at the end where we kind of like recap what we learned. Uh, we do our stretches, um, hand stretches, like posture stretches. It's all like very important. I know I messed up my hands a lot with like Super Smash Bros. Um, what I've really learned with like the physical aspect is I guess the biggest things are it's all preventative or at least for the most part. Like once you feel that pain, it's almost like too late. 
So really get them to buy in. Like it's all preventative. So you do not want to get to the point where it starts hurting because then it's a lot harder to fix. Um, the other thing is a lot of the pain comes from repetition. Uh, like I got Super Smash Bros. I did the same technique over and over again for hours. Um, and I got really good at it, but yeah, I really messed up my hands. So whenever you do some of these like uh, micro trainings, make sure to like mix it up. And I think that's more fun anyway to kind of like mix it up rather just doing the same thing for hours. Yeah, Alex, h- how do you get that buy-in? Um, uh, for things like that. Cause I, for my teams, um, you know, I've, I've had the athletic trainers come in and kind of set us up with a, a set of hand stretches. I've looked up stuff like, uh, I used to watch day nine, this, this famous Starcraft video game, uh, YouTuber. And he had like a hand stretch video that I'd walk my team through, but I, I really struggled to get buy-in from my team for things like that. Yeah, I think with anything almost is you got to look to your student leaders. Like I'm just like some guy in charge, but like uh, some of these student leaders, like the captains and like we talk about possibly like those challenger players in your program, a lot of people like look up to them. A lot of people like respect them, like your seniors. Um, if you can get them to buy in, I think it'll like really snowball throughout your program. Yeah, yeah. Okay, yeah, that makes a lot of sense. And uh, I guess to answer for, for my programs in the past, um, at Alvernia, we haven't figured that out yet. We launched in August, but um, I, I think... I've, like I said, we brought in the ATs for hand stretching and kind of showed them the benefits um, the best we could. I've struggled a little bit with buy-in there. I'm definitely going to try to implement, maybe trying to get my, my leaders on board at Alvernia. Um, and then for us, we, we're based in athletics, um, but rather than have like a, a weekly lifting session or you know two, three times a week, um, we just offer that as a resource that if one of our students wants to schedule a time with our athletic trainer, they can do that. Um, if they want to hop in with another team that it makes sense schedule wise, um, I'll talk to that coach and see, Hey, would you be willing to just kind of let our, our, our player lift with your team? They really want to lift and, and learn. Um, but our team doesn't do that formally. And I've, I've gotten good reception from almost every coach I've asked. They've been totally down for that. Um, at least to give it a try and see how it goes. Um, but I don't have any uh, like mandatory stuff other than just like, say we have a long day of matches rather than talk about what we're doing sitting in the lounge, we'll go for a walk around campus and talk about what we're doing, stuff like that. I think it's important to get, I don't know, make sure they have some lifestyle component. You know, if they're not getting any exercise at all, they're not moving besides walking to the facility and walking back to their dorm. I try to my best to identify that and at least encourage them to do something, you know, even if it's just going for a walk. Yeah, no, that's awesome. And I'll say that, like, don't get me wrong. Like, it's definitely awkward the first couple of times you like all stretch together. But I think if you do it enough and you create that repetition, it's almost like weird when you don't do it. Um, and I'll also add that like we, we do workouts at Randolph Macon. We have an hour workout. It was a little weird with the pandemic, uh, but we mostly focus on running, uh, like the cardiovascular health, um, where it's, you can imagine like playing a game, it's your heartbeat's crazy. It's going really fast. So if you have a strong cardiovascular health and you like run a lot and you're a healthy person, you're able to kind of control your heart rate a little bit more when your heart's pounding out of your chest in these like high pressure situations, you'll more likely to make mistakes. Um, and with that, uh, in between rounds or in between whatever your heart rate can recover faster. Cause you can imagine like you just come off of like a really crazy game and you're still freaking out from the game before that. Like you haven't like reset and calmed down yet. Uh, so if you can build that cardiovascular health it makes a huge difference performance wise. So I have one more question for you guys, and then we're going to move to uh, Twitch questions. So do you have an individual coaching philosophy? And if so, what does that look like? Ooh, I, I'll let Alex handle this one first. <laughs> so you under the bus there, Alex. I am. Um, I am indeed. Yeah. So my main coaching philosophy is a lot of like the mental game and kind of got to talk about like the performance. Like at the end of the day, like the esports athletes are like performers, like how they show up that day. Um, so what I really try to focus on is creating a lot of support for them. Um, like academically, like college is very, very difficult, especially for my freshmen. Um, so I try to create like we have tutors, like study halls, like as much academic as sport as I can. Because you can imagine like these pro teams, like they have like chefs, maids, trainers, like whatever, anything that they need to do to take as much pressure off them so they can focus on just playing the game. So as much pressure and stress I can take off them, the better they will perform. Like the happier they are, like they just, the confidence levels are so much higher. Um, I'll say, I have one more point. Oh yeah. Like with midterm week. um, So it's unbelievable. Like we make playoffs pretty consistently, but our midterm week winning percentage is like almost zero because of the stress of like midterms or whatever, like tests. And if you've talked to a player after a game, like, Hey, why don't you play so well? I was like, sorry. Like I was just like so stressed out about a test tomorrow. And like some of those things can really affect performance for sure. So creating that mental game and like that mental toughness, I can go on and on about like mental toughness and stuff. Maybe we can talk about it if we have extra time, but uh, yeah, the mentality I think is a huge part. Wow. That's, 
I, I know maybe this is the, not the main emphasis that you're going for, but the fact that you have identified that midterm week is a week where your team struggles the most is like something I never thought to think Alex about. Alex is over there playing 40 chess. Right? <laughs> right? <laughs> like, oh, I'm just happy I could be on here with Alex to be yeah, honest. Right? But uh, I'd say for me, um, I don't know if I necessarily have like one coaching philosophy, but I've been on some really great teams in the past and had some success um through a lot of the leaders in my life so i guess I'll, I'll, I'll name drop a little bit here but i think it helped a lot um is that i went to the first nace convention um and i met drake porter um who was the the former league of legends coach for columbia college and one thing he said to me was um you know that he believes that a coach should be a leader a teacher and an expert and uh i heard that and i'm like well i think i'm an okay leader and I might be an okay teacher, but I'm definitely not an expert in a lot of these games. And I kind of had to accept that those three things are great, but no one's going to do all of those perfectly. So f- identifying my own skill set and the skill sets of my assistant coaches and then helping them implement that for the team has been big. You know, like if I have someone who is an excellent communicator of the game, I'm going to utilize that. So people don't want to listen to me uh, give a long winded answer as I often do, um, about whatever is happening, right? If someone can communicate something in a way that resonates with your players, that's great. Um, and then an- another thing that was just so big is just showing your players that you care. Um, a-, a lot of people might not know this, but Travis Yang, who's the, the coach at Texas A&M University of San Antonio, he, uh, he was actually the general manager for my StarCraft team back when I, I played years ago in college and, people loved Travis because they knew how much he cared about him. Like Travis shows how much he cares about his players through his quality time that he spends with them and just his investment in them as, as people. And that made our team so motivated. We had like two years um, when we were playing in, in the world championship series. I wasn't, I wasn't quite good enough, but my teammates were, and uh, like where we like be, the motivation was so high because Travis was so involved and everyone knew everyone wanted to do their best for Travis and I think if you can show your students how much you care about them, that that goes f- much further than anyone could ever realize. And uh, I guess just the last thing is just, and I hit on, uh, hit on this before, is just developing consensus on your team is, is so big. Um, our Overwatch team started out like all gold and plat. And over the course of the three years at Ashland, um, our whole team um, grew to at least masters and many of them hit GM and a couple top 500, which was crazy. Like, I, 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 don't get me wrong. I think that was a little bit of luck, but it certainly was not because I am a good overwatch coach or have insane overwatch knowledge. I do not. Um, it was because the team got really invested in each other, kind of hinting back to what uh, the Travis point, but also because um, we were able to develop consensus on our team about what we wanted to work on. And we were able to incrementally grow working on one or two things at a time throughout those two or three years. So I think that can go a long way. Yeah. I like that a lot. Yeah. Lead by example, Josh. I like it. All right. So I'm going to grab a couple of viewer questions and I'm going to throw the first one at Josh because you seem to be the, uh, the FPS expert out of us three. What role does aim training software <laughs> have in coaching and player development? Um, so I feel like I've had successful FPS teams, but I am definitely not an XDF, uh, FPS expert, to be honest. Um, but I know at least from my experience that my players use it pretty consistently, um, whether that's the aim training software or it's like the in-game resources, like our, our counter-strike team was pretty good. And I'll, almost all of them spent, I would say on average, at least an hour a day doing, um, death match, doing, uh, like either various aim trainers, aim bots in the game, um, anything they can do to kind of improve their mechanical skill. And I think that's a discipline in FPS, much like you'd see in traditional sports. Um, I think you need to be willing to put in the time each day or at least a few times a week um, to get that mechanical skill. Because if you're not doing that to improve, somebody else is, right? Um, so I think, and I think having that consistency is good. Um, we used to have a player who would sit there and legitimately, like there were some days, he must have been listening to music and jamming for like four or five hours doing aim training. And I think that is not the ticket. He did not see more improvement than the people who just spent 30 minutes to an hour uh, a day doing it. Um, so I think just a little bit of time each day can make a big difference. Um, so next question uh, was asked, is it better to have one coach focus on two or three games or do you, or 
or you have one coach per game. And main question, the reason this question is asked is because there's definitely a limited budget going around for collegiate esports teams at the moment. Yeah, I would say that. Um, so my philosophy with the esports is I think once you get up to like a diamond dish level, which like, of course that's different for like every single game, but like a top 5% level, um, it becomes a lot of execution based and a lot of like the more micro aspects. I think like it's a lot of macro like ideas and negotiations and like talking, um, up until then. And I think if you have like lower level teams, you can get away with just kind of like we talked about, um, just getting communication going with the teams and like talking about asking good questions. And then once you get like a top level team, it's like Diamond Plus, you probably need to bring in a professional uh, to help find those like little tiny mistakes because they're very few and far between at that point. Yeah, and I just want to quick, quickly echo that point that I think um, I think having a, a specific coach for each game is almost always going to be better, but not every program is at that point, right? Like, uh, I mean, heck, three or four years ago, like the average program had a part-time coach and that was it. Right. So we're, we've got moved to the point where I think most programs have like one full time staff member. Maybe they have a couple part time, maybe. Um, so just use the resources that you have, um, I think. And I, I can't really imagine almost any circumstance where having just one person trying to coach five games is better than having a director and then a coach for each game. But you just might not be there yet. Um, I don't think many programs are at the point where they I'd say a vast majority of programs actually aren't at the point where they have a full-time or even a part-time coach for every game. So um, I'd say just kind of use the resources the best you can. Um, and, you know, if you're like, for instance, this year um, at Alvernia, uh, we have just enough budget to hire um, two very part-time, very part-time uh, assistant coaches for our games. So I'm like, well, this year we're doing four games, Smash, Overwatch League and Rocket League. I have some experience coaching and playing Overwatch and Smash. So I'm going to take those two as the director and then I'm going to have the part-time positions be Rocket League and League of Legends, which I have zero qualifications to coach. So uh, maybe this is not super good advice, but use some common sense, right? In that um, you may not have all the resources to so just identify what you do have and then implement that the best you can. So sort of on the same subject, what is your thoughts on having, say, an FPS coach that's in charge of CSGO and Valorant? And then maybe a MOBA coach that's in charge of League of Legends and Dota, but sort of like branching the coaches off into genres instead of specific games. I would just say that um, I, I think a big thing about it is having someone present at the practices. I think it's very difficult, especially with the pandemic, how like people are so spread out, like playing from home. Um, if you can have someone present at the practices, like a staff member, it makes a huge difference because I think they'll take it more seriously. Like it, it leads to more practice and less playing. Um, you can like maintain the structure that way. So um, and depending on how that staffing goes, like if you have a big enough program, you will need like m multiple staff members and stuff. As long as you have someone there, I think it's very beneficial. Yeah. Yeah. And I just wanted to add on to Alex's point, uh, I guess, before we move on to, to JJ's question is uh, that uh, I think the staff member there is actually so important, um, especially if there's someone who is I mean, as expected to be engaged, right? Watching, making sure the team is, is focused, identifying things um, that at least you hear, maybe even with just communication wise, I feel like almost anyone can help as a communications coach, even if you don't necessarily have all the game knowledge. Um but I'd say, like, even if you're just a one-man show for four games, five games, like, I would even recommend that, like, two practices a week where you can be there and be engaged is probably better than three practices where the team is on their own trying to figure things out or four practices. Um, obviously, I think for most games, you probably want to try to get in a little more than two times a week. But I think, like, have, like just echoing this point, having someone there to guide the team goes such a long way even if it's just someone who they're like wow this person cares enough about me that they're going to sit here during our practice even if they have no idea what's going on and, and and care about us and try to help us keep organized and help us be successful i think it goes a long long way uh a question that came in for it looks like from boise state is how do you feel about other coaches evaluating you oh, that's alex, a tough one alex how, staring what? up in the space <laughs> like, and that's what I think is difficult about a coaches. And you see it all the time with like pro teams is like how are coaches measured other than just like wins and losses. Like you guys don't know, necessarily see what goes on in the background. I appreciate this opportunity to kind of like talk about more of the behind the scenes of what we do at Randolph Macon. But yeah, I don't know how a coach would judge another coach based on anything other than just like wins and losses to an extent. Yeah. Um, especially from the outside, but 
maybe that's something we should be doing. Like I haven't heard <laughs> about too many people doing this, but that's a yeah, it's great a, it idea. Sparks like an honest. entire thought, right? Right. Like, well, it's a wow. light bulb. Well, I, I don't know who the staff are at Boise State, but there's some smart people. We should listen to them um, because, uh, like, I think that's a great idea. Um, something to one keep thing. In mind. Oh, go ahead. I'm sorry. I was gonna say one thing that I think I would do if I was gonna try to implement something like that um, is maybe have a conversation with one of my colleagues who I feel like would be willing to donate some time to us, talk about our team and how we, how I currently approach coaching and then what my goals are and what I think I'm doing well, what I'm not doing well. Then I would have them observe our coaching session and then I would get their feedback afterward. That way they know what I'm trying to do, what I think I'm doing well, and then they can evaluate from that standpoint. Because I think if you have someone just hop in a practice and say what you're doing right or wrong, uh, I mean, coaching has so much potential and there's so many things you can do that you know, they're probably going to have 50 things I could have been doing better and 50 things I'm doing great. So um, I think that could go a long way if you wanted to implement something like that. And uh, who knows, maybe I'll, I'll be having Doc Haskell hop in one of our practices one night. Um, so I, I think we have one last viewer question and it's, do you, do your programs have mandatory study hall, study session, study hall? Uh, yes, we do. Um, it's based on GPA anywhere from one to four hours. Um, and yeah, we get all a bunch of gamers into a room and they'll study together. Fortunately, as like a small private school, uh, a lot of my students have like classes together. So it makes it even easier. Um, and we has, also have some tutors as well. Uh, but yeah, one to four hours every week. Yep. Uh, we've, we've tried a whole bunch of different things um, at Ashland and then going into Alvernia. Um, we, we tried kind of the, the study tables where people could go in whatever time they were free. And it found that because they weren't in a group, I felt like they didn't get much out of it. We had people going in as groups and that was a bit more successful. Um, I think what we ended up having the most success with was having students uh, basically have a certain number of hours that they have to either spend with an academic advisor. Um, at Ashland, we had an academic advisor just for athletics specifically, and she was awesome. Um, so if you have someone like that on campus, who's like a rock star, like do it. Shout out to you, Elizabeth. You helped our team so much. Thank you. Um, but also just going to the writing center, things like that. Um, but we did that based on GPA as well. Um, so, and to some extent, uh, depending on your department, it also might not be your choice. You know, like there's a, there's a chance that, you know, your school has certain policies in place, but you might be able to work with them to figure out what fits your team. So we had some, some clarification for, on the last question is it's being coached on coaching by another coach. And I can, I can talk for me personally that I'm always asking other program directors and other coaches, like how necessarily they're doing things to maybe try to find a way that I can do what, what I've been doing better. Um, I think anybody that says they know everything is wrong. And if they think they're done learning, then, then they're really going to stunt their development. I have nothing to add. That was perfect. I totally agree. <laughs> Um, I think that's it for the questions. Do you guys have any closing thoughts on anything you want, you'd like to tell the membership about esports coaching? Uh, I mean, I guess, I don't know if I have something I want to tell them about coaching, but I guess this jumps off of your point, which is like, you never stop learning. And I would love to have more things like this with different people, like selfishly, like if there was something like this every week where I could listen to two coaches talk about their experience, I would love that because I'm sure I would learn a ton. I can it, it helps and lets me know that I can relate to these people. Like talking to Alex and you, it lets me know that my struggles are not my own and that there are answers to them or at least some solidarity that these are things that are just difficult. Um, so I would love to see something like this more often. I think this was great. Yeah, I completely agree. Like some of my best learning has been done, like talking to other directors and stuff. Like as the sole staff member, I, I don't have as much like collaboration opportunity. So it's really nice to talk to other directors. Um, and I guess if you, if you don't mind, like, I just like one last topic I really want to talk about with coaching, uh, I think is super important is like confidence and like confidence levels. Um, unfortunately you guys are watching this virtually. So maybe you can like pull up a second tab and like, look up like the Dunning Kruger effect. If you haven't oh. heard of it, you can look it up. Oh, I think that's okay. very important with esports. Uh, something a lot of people talk about a lot. And then you can basically see it talks about confidence level versus like skill level. And you can see like with Randolph Macon, it's amazing to see some of our B teams have so much confidence uh, compared to our A teams. And I think that confidence makes a huge difference. The, my B team upsets have been as my B team won the ECAC championship because they had the confidence. Like they had that like Dunning-Kruger effect almost where they like they truly believe that they can win and like that. Um, 
perception is reality um, makes a huge difference. Like as much as you can build the confidence of your players, of course, you don't want to go overboard with the ego, of course. But I think ego is something that is better than you think. Yeah, I totally agree. And confidence is a weird thing, um, how it develops. Like I've heard someone say that you develop true confidence by doing something over and over and over again until you're confident that you can do it, right? Um, and I think I agree with that. But does that contradict the Dunning-Kruger effect and that? <laughs> Dunning-Kruger <laughs> like, effect is the better you are at something, the worse you think you are. But it, yeah. it's on a curve, right? Like when you when you achieve true mastery of something, it, it sort of levels out. Yeah, so that's an interesting one. I think that's something that could be its whole own panel. And uh, I, that's something I reference a lot. Um, Alex, I might snag you sometime and just talk about that. <laughs> awesome. All right. Uh, we're going to wrap up here. I want to go ahead and thank everybody for coming out and, and watching and supporting us and, and being in Twitch. And I'd like to especially thank the people that ask questions because you've really contributed to the discussion. Um, and I wish you guys to have a great rest of your day. Thank awesome. You. Thank you, JJ. Thanks, Alex.